Lord God, we come to you in submission to your will. There are times where it seems that the world is in control, but you are sovereign. Amen. And as we study in the book of Daniel, we see the sovereignty of God over all things. We are charged, we are charged to be salt and light in the world, but at the end of the day, you are the sovereign God. We seek after you, we seek your wisdom, for in it is truth. We pray for your word today, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Sometimes the rulers of the world in the political realm are known. You, you know who the president of Russia is, Putin. Ukraine, Zelensky. America's got Biden in the presidency. But sometimes there are leaders who behind the scenes are influencing and in many ways exerting uh, authority. One of those would be Klaus Schwab who you've heard of, the leader of the World Economic Forum. He has a little minion that is sort of like his right-hand man, whose name is Harari. Harari, this last week in an interview, said that with the advent of AI, there will finally be a superhuman intelligence to give us a book, a holy scripture, that is actually correct. <laughs> So this was a, a direct head-on attack mm -hmm. against the true word of God, which does come from supernatural higher intelligence. So, so you, you don't, you don't yeah. believe that the uh, song they just put out with the Beatles <laughs> by AI is really a Beatles song? <laughs> I didn't hear about that one. <laughs> they just released the latest Beatles song. On AI? It was done by AI. Mm -hmm. yes. Wow. <laughs> well, it's a brave new world, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yes. And it would be, well, that's, I'm so glad you just said that, scary. It would be scary if we didn't know that the same God that could change Nebuchadnezzar's heart and break through the most willful, stubborn, wicked heart on earth. I mean, think about the wickedness of Nebuchadnezzar. What did he do just in the previous chapter that we studied? He burned up. He built a furnace and a idol, and if anybody wouldn't worship the idol, he would throw them in a furnace. Can you get more wicked than that? That is pretty well the definition of, of wickedness. Just like Yuval Harari. So, God actually is sovereign even over the most wicked human hearts on the planet. Um, some people have taught, and this is essentially Arminian theology, that the sovereign, the final arbiter in terms of human destination, is the human will. The human will. Everybody should acknowledge that God is sovereign, but people also assert that man has free will. And what happens if these two run headlong into one another? Which one is finally decisive? That is the question between the Calvinist and the Arminian. It cannot be both because ultimately there's only one that's sovereign in that particular headlong collision, head-on collision. Amen. The quiet part of the Arminian theology was stated loudly by someone named Stephen Furtick. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Stephen Furtick said, there is one thing that God cannot do. He cannot override your unbelief. Ultimately, in that scheme, if someone's will, resisting the Holy Spirit, does not want to do the things of God, God cannot do differently. Now, what is the teaching of Scripture? John 6, 44. We saw it again in John 14. Cannot receive the Holy Spirit again and again, just as in Romans 8, 7, and 8. There is something that cannot be done. It is man cannot please God. Does that mean he can't say no to God? Uh, I, you're putting me on the spot right now, brother. No, we agree. God, God is man sovereign. will say no to God. God, God right. man, if man says no to God, God has the sovereignty to say, okay. He could, yes. He could absolutely, if someone says no, and it is within man's ability to say no to God. We Correct. agree. Correct. Because people do resist God's will. In fact, I'll take it a step farther, in agreement with John. It is man's nature 
to say no to God. That's part of the sinful fault. A slave to sin, a child of Satan, John chapter 8, will say no to God. That is the natural state of fallen man. They are dead in sin, and they do resist his will. God That's just, their natural... Yeah. God just said okay to Pharaoh. Correct. It says he hardened his heart, but his heart was hardened, and God allowed him to go down that path. Yeah, and then... His sovereign will. Correct. The judicial hardening, when God judicially hardens somebody, they themselves, it's, he's not taking someone who's saying, save me, save me, I want to be saved, and God says, no, you will be hard and die. <laughs> it's not that. The, the natural, wicked, moral state of man is to resist God's will. It is to say no to God. Correct. Here's what we should not say. What Stephen Furtick said and what Arminian theology says, there's something that God cannot do. Mm -hmm. He cannot override your unbelief. You want to know an example of God overriding unbelief? Daniel chapter 4. Let's go. <laughs> Did you know I had that plan the whole time? To go to <laughs> My introductions obviously come from the main thing. The way John and I study in Scripture and, and preach is to spend time doing exegesis of the text. And that pericope will give to you the main idea of what the author wants to communicate. It's our responsibility to communicate that, and the preacher does bridge the world of the scripture to the world in which we live, no matter the time. So we make application of those things, but we're only saying what the scripture says in human illustrations of, of today. Does that make sense? So that's the point. There is a point of Daniel 4. And this particular per pericope, I could not break up into smaller sections because it really functions as a unit, the fourth chapter. So we're going to go through the whole fourth chapter. And this chapter is the big idea of Daniel the book. This is the point. The big idea of the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. John taught an entire lesson on this so well, did an amazing job, over all human history. All human history. As seen in the ease with which God directs even the most willful and wicked of human hearts. He easily overrides Nebuchadnezzar's unbelief. The most wicked and most powerful king in the world, he turns his heart like a water course. The scripture says God can turn the heart of a king like a water course. And we're about to see him do it. So today, instead of having a lot of subtext to read, because we have so much territory to cover, we're going to go around the room and just read Daniel 4, 37 verses, and I'll comment as we go. How's that sound? That sounds good. Very Calvary. Very Calvary. Very Yes. Verse by verse. Verse by verse. Let's go. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. I'm glad your translation had it as Nebuchadnezzar coming first. Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The idea here is to emphasize his sovereignty. He is the king. He's the sovereign over the land. And he is directing the peoples, the nations, the languages that dwell in, note this word, all. All the earth. The idea here is that the Babylonian kingdom, having replaced Assyria as the world power, is now the power over all the earth. Now, of course, that wouldn't, they wouldn't really know Japan. And they wouldn't know the United, what is now the United States of America. They wouldn't know North America. But as far as the known world, there was none that could stand against this empire. It had dominion over anything it wanted. It had gone as far as Egypt and, and really the dominant power. So when it says in all the earth, the idea here is dominion. It's, it's the empire. And he says, peace be multiplied to you. Candy verses two and three. Yeah. I, I, first yeah. of all, everything you've said about Nebuchadnezzar, the fact that he would say peace to you in and of itself is ironic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man of peace, right? Yes. As long as you do what I tell you. Okay. Otherwise, the peace means you're at peace in a fiery furnace. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Verses 2 and 3. It hath seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, but how mighty his wonders. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Okay, wow. so that is a powerful wow. statement. And you're going to see it at least three major places in chapter four. So it's the restatement of it that clues in the reader that this is the point. Okay. The point of the book is to say that it's God's kingdom, not Nebuchadnezzar's, not Babylon, but God's kingdom that is sovereign. It is the everlasting. It has dominion. And here it is Nebuchadnezzar himself that confesses it. Do you think that was part of God's plan? Mm -hmm. No, sure. To put these words into the mouth of the most powerful man on earth. And prior to this chapter, he's still wicked. Now, what's happening here is he's writing a letter after something occurs to him. It's really a seven-year ordeal that he's going to go through. And he's now prefacing the telling of that by writing a letter to all the people. He is publishing the news. It's amazing. Can you imagine this? That Israel was sent into captivity... And the king then sent the message of Yahweh throughout all of the land. Anybody who believes in Yahweh will be saved. So Israel was a lighthouse to the nations. The, the creation of the nation Israel, beginning in Genesis 12 and culminating in the rest of the book of Genesis, as the tribes are, are born from, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was to mediate blessing to the world. They are the lighthouse to the nations. They have the true God, whereas all the surrounding gods are nothing but idols. Mm. And here in the, the captivity, they're brought into captivity and that light is sent to the ends of the earth. I think it is a picture of the, the missionary heart of God that will come to fruition in the new covenant. Mm. When rather than a magnet for the nations like the Queen of Sheba to come see Solomon, this, this lighthouse in the center of the world, in the missionary mandate of the Great Commission, we will have God's heart for the nations explicitly go and tell, go into all the earth. And so instead of come and see, it will become go and tell. But you're seeing pictures of it even here. Mm -hmm. sure. This gospel, this good news of Yahweh is being published to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Is, is the one through four, are these the words of Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, yeah. Oh, okay, but there's, there's no quotes or anything. They're not saying... Nebuchadnezzar said, or, uh, oh, it's intended, she says. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just want to make sure it wasn't Daniel talking about Nebuchadnezzar. So in the, Nebuchadnezzar yeah. talking well, look at the pro, uh, in the, the Hebrew, pro in yeah. the Hebrew things mm -hmm. like uh, quotations yeah. and stuff like that don't exist. Right. So the, the writing, the, 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 the intent of this is, I Nebuchadnezzar, and saying, and saying this to all the people, is the implication these are his words in a letter to all the people. Right, and when you get to verse 4, it becomes explicit because he'll identify the I, mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar, but in verses 2 and 3, the, the pronoun there, me, mm -hmm. you have to follow the pronouns in order to get to who's speaking. Yeah, so um, in verses 2 and 3, it, it seemed good to me, um, and then in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. So you'll learn it at that point, yeah. All right, so let's do that. Verses uh, 4 and 5. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Mm -hmm. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Okay, consider the contrast. Chicopos? Chicopos, yeah. Well, he, the idea there, he's at rest. Janet, what version is that? New King James. New King James, he's at rest. ESV says at ease. Mm -hmm. Then it follows with prosperity. The idea here is he's just resting at ease and prosperity. He is, he has no worry in the world. He's fine. Everything is good. He's on top of the mountain. He's the king of kings in the land. All is well. Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Here in just a night's sleep, the peace departs from him. And all of a sudden, he still has everything, but he's completely ridden with anxiety. He says, I saw a dream that made me afraid. Fear grips him. And we don't get from the sense of this that it's like, oh, you know, you wake up in a little night terror and then you shake it off by the time you go to the bathroom. The idea here is he's gripped by, I became afraid as I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. 
Whatever he saw, just like the first time this happened to him, remember that when he was the, the, the it troubled him so much he called all the astrologers. He, is, he knows that this is something significant and he is alarmed. That's the word. It alarmed me. Make sense? Yeah. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. He's just totally lost his peace. Okay, Barbara, if you would read six to nine. <clears throat> So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He called, it Bel he called Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. Isn't this ironic? Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar is very hard-hearted. He is very willful, because he's been down this road before. Earlier on, he had this troubling, alarming dream, and something clicked in his mind, my astrologers and my enchanters and my Chaldeans, these guys are a fraud. I'm going to make them tell me what I dream before they give me the interpretation. But then along comes Daniel, who actually is able to do that by the spirit of Yahweh alone. And instead of submitting to Yahweh as the only sovereign, what does he do? He clearly has reverted back to his old ways. He still has magicians and enchanters and Chaldeans, and he considers them useful, helpful guides. In fact, he's even forgotten his early, earlier revelation, which is that these guys could just be totally making stuff up. In the past, he would make them tell what the dream is before they interpret it. Here, he tells them the dream and says, what's the interpretation? And now they can't even do that. They're, they're so impotent, they can't even come up with a good, believable story. <laughs> which, is, which is just another little piece of the sovereignty of God. Yes. And these, these wise guys, yep, wise men, <laughs> their mouths were shut. They were shut. They yep. would have, but God said, no. Uh, like they couldn't even think of something yep. believable. In the past, they were more prideful and more quick with their tongue. And next thing you know, now they're just completely rendered impotent. And yet the king, the point here though, is the king is reverting to his old ways. Remember? He's already confessed the sovereignty of God earlier in the book. And then he built an idol. Yeah. And he's back to his old ways. He's got his magicians, just the gods of the land. He's back to his old ways. He's hard-hearted. And who can God really break this hard heart? That's the question. I mean, this guy has all the power in the world. And he's as wicked as the day is long. He's back to his old ways. What's going to happen? And what he says here later, he, he called on Daniel. Again, consider the grace of God. This isn't the first time. He's already seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come through the fiery furnace. What more is it going to take to change this man's heart and to cause him to believe in the sovereignty of God, Yahweh, over everything. Not just a God amongst many. What's going to change him? Well, at last Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God. What does that say? Still trusting in his God. Yeah, and when does he tell this story? When is he writing this to the people? After the fact. After the fact. Yeah. It could very well be from this evidence that even when God forces him to confess, as we see at the end of Daniel 4, he's still not getting it. And so there's debate between scholars. Is Nebuchadnezzar going to be in heaven? Guess who knows that? Yes. Let God be the judge of all the earth. There's some indication here that he's only seeing Neb Belteshazzar as being one among the gods, and he's named after this other god. Or he could simply be here reminding us that earlier on, he considered Daniel just another guy and named him after his god, and then the culmination is at the end of the book where he's saying, forget all the other gods, this is the one true god. This is something that troubles me, our neighbor across the street. 
is constantly complaining about the wickedness in the world, which is really great. Yeah. But it's a matter of power. Well, uh, an awful lot of things have to do with retaining your own power. Okay. And I think uh, his his mindset from where he was comfortable and prosperous never came from his previous uh, idols and wishes and things like that. Um, when put to the test, he had to admit God was real. Yeah. But to fall back into it, I've seen it a hundred times. Falling back, fall yeah. Fall back into it. Sadly, we've seen it so many times, haven't we? Just over the years, all of us. It's just people control. that we thought had gotten it, and then they fall back. Yeah. And of course, First John tells us that shows that they never really were of us. In other words, we didn't judge perfectly that this was truly a saved person. Because we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know who genuinely is saved. Mm -hmm. We have enough indication to know them by their fruit and make right. judgments and treat people that way, but we're not infallible in that, in that knowledge. So here he's recognizing that Daniel can do what the others can't. Mm. Chief of the mag magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. That, that's kind of where he's at at the moment in, in this uh, occurrence. No mystery is too difficult for you, for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. Think God can do it? <laughs> Carol, do you want to read uh, 10 to 12? Sure. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for the, all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. So clearly this is a picture of his ease and prosperity. Mm -hmm. the, the flowering uh, of the world, the tree is just a shelter for the birds and it, it is just providing food and everything is beautiful and easy and prosperous. And then verse 13 to 18. <laughs> okay. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud, said thus, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a hand of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills and sets over it to the lowliest of men. This, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar saw, and you, O Beth Sajer, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able for the spirit of the holy God, God's is in you. Interesting. Yeah. So the vision takes a dark turn. But it's actually the watchers, the holy ones who come, much has been studied and talked about with regard to who are these watchers. Um, there's a scholar named Michael Heiser mm -hmm. who's brought out a lot of capital from this. Um, I don't think that the point of the text here is really angelology per se. Mm -hmm. I don't think that God here is wanting us to speculate on what the council is that surrounds God. All that I think is meant here is that these are created beings mm -hmm. that are not human, these are angels, if you use it in the broader sense, that some kind of non-human sentient being that's conscious, conscious and very powerful. Mm -hmm. It's some kind of angel mm -hmm. that God sends into mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. So he, he, the uh, arrival of this watcher is in verse 13. Mm -hmm. A watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. What does watcher imply? Someone who observes. Observer. Observer. Somebody who can see. Do you think there's angels that can see us right now? Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Do you think that all of those angels, in the in that sense, are good angels, no. or are some fall? Fall. There's a world that we can't see that can see us. There, there is an angelic spiritual realm, and we have to be aware of that. I think through the Enlightenment and our Western eyes, a materialistic kind of um, worldview, we forget that. That there are, in fact, angels and demons. Aren't the yeah. lectures referred to in the book of Enoch? Yes. yes, and there's a lot of debate as to how authentic what we currently have in our English translation, which comes from a Mormon publishing company in Utah. I think Jude refers to yeah. that. What's that? Jude. He refers to that. Yeah, Jude does. Yeah, he refers f refers to to Enoch. Yeah. Um, yeah. So who these watchers are? I, I my point is I don't think we should go too far down the lane of speculating on those things, but we are to be aware that these watchers exist. They can see what's going on. They have a purpose that God. But see, the bigger idea we don't want to miss this. God is sovereignly dispatching this angel, this watcher, yes, that's it. because he's going to change things. And in verse 14, he proclaims aloud and said thus, chop down the tree. <laughs> wow. Wow. Humble the prideful. Who is the sovereign here? Here, It is not the tree. The tree God allowed to grow and for those purposes. Yes, he was causing the earth to prosper in many ways. Even though he's a wicked man, because of the empire, there are benefits that came. You see that also in the Roman Empire. As wicked as it was, you have the Pax Romana. You have roads built. You have um, peace. Very often that, that can happen. But it's actually God doing it. Yeah. For whatever his purpose is. We studied this at length in Isaiah chapter 10. When God would wield the, the kingdom of Assyria for his purpose. Even though the king himself did not so intend in his heart. You have this parallel invisible world and what's happening visibly running in tandem for different purposes. God is doing one thing while the empire has its own purpose. And the Roman Bruce allowed the spread of the gospel. That's yeah, that was God's purpose. Yeah, he was paving the way for the gospel. Right. Sure. Yes. Uh, at the end of verse 18, yes. for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Uh, yeah. Nebuchadnezzar recognizing that is that referring to the angels or the Holy Spirit? Or? I think it's more of that nebulous idea that God is with me. Is he being recognizes able, yes. God's presence. Yeah, and but see, again, but it's he not... He says the God. Yeah. Again, even here, he's not confessing the true God. Yeah. So, and maybe that's just him at the time, you know, when he hasn't yet come to the full understanding, because Daniel hasn't even given the answer yet. Yes, Bob. Um, in that part, he was talking about the destruction of the tree. Uh, if there's any question with regard to who's talking about, he uses the word him at the bottom, at the uh, middle of, of uh, verse 15. Let yeah. him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Right. It becomes, yeah. goes from the inanimate yeah. to the animate. Right, right, right. right. And yes. stuff after that isn't very happy either. Right. Cool. Yeah. Well, right. put yourself in Daniel's shoes and then. I guess. Yeah, well, yeah. just saying that, well, during this time too, God's had specific purposes there. Some for rain, some yeah. for uh, war, some for, and so um, part, of, part of the thinking that's happening there is, as he's saying, the gods, this particular God, Yahweh, is really good at interpreting dreams. Mm -hmm. This God is really yeah. good yeah. about, yeah. you know, yeah. sit, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's what that's he's where he's at at this point in the text. Yeah, really right. It's, it's yeah. more of an action than it is the faith. understanding the presence of a, a holy, holy God. God. Yeah, right. He's there's a supreme God. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's a, at this point in time, there still seems to be a, a struggle within mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar yes. because in right. verse 17, right. he acknowledges the watcher's decree. Mm -hmm. And he says, to the end that the living may know that the most high. The. Yeah. Okay, right. but at the end of it, he comes back to, I know you are for the spirit of the, the holy gods. Yes. So mm -hmm. he's still struggling yep. mm -hmm. with an acknowledgement. That's right. Rod, would you read for us uh, verse 19? Yes. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, My lord, 
if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your mm. adversaries. Just stop there. Can you imagine what Daniel has to say oh. to the most yeah. powerful man on the earth? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> good news and bad news. Yeah. yeah. The good news is bad. Yeah. yeah. This is tough, but it, it requires courage. When you have a situation where you have to say hard things to a family member, somebody close to you, a friend, somebody, you don't want to say it. It is so much easier for you to shade the truth. But it takes courage. Now, here's the thing. Truth telling means that you are speaking for the benefit of the other. If you want to do what's best for your own comfort, then you'll shade the truth. Think about that for a second. If you're willing to say the hardest things, that's for the good of others. You care about others. But if you're not willing to say hard things, that means you're really only caring about yourself. Making your life easier. Now, ultimately, it's not for your good, by the way. Your good would be to tell the truth and then to have eternal reward for being on the side of truth. But here, I love Daniel's heart because he, he softens it by the sense of saying, I don't want this to be what I have to tell you. I'm not delighting in what I'm about to say. I wish this was about your enemies, King, and not about you. But look, he has the courage to say it. So 20 to 26, Rich, will you do it? 20 to 26. Oh, okay. Um, the tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to the heavens, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all under which the beasts of the field found shade and in those branches the birds of the air lived. It is you, O king, who <clears throat> have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw and watched... A watcher. A uh, holy one. He saw a watcher. A watcher, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in, that, <clears throat> in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation of Cain. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. Capitalized. <laughs> yeah. And as it is commanded, as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for your, uh, confirmed for you from time from the time that you know that heaven rules. And there in two words is a summary mm -hmm. of the main idea of the book. Until you know that heaven rules. Mm -hmm. Heaven rules. Yeah. Um, stated elsewise here, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. It's God who's on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand that because he thought he was the tree and he was the top, but yeah, it was God. How far into the future is Daniel himself able to see? I mean, he's being given prophecy from God. Yeah. But it, it's curious to know. Well, how okay. The story. So in different instances, he sees farther, but it's always according to the spirit of revelation given in that prophecy. So the farthest that we know he saw is in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. He actually sees 483 years, and then there's a gap, and he even sees the last seven years of this world. Right. 
And in Daniel 12, 3, he sees the resurrection of the dead. So I think he's, he sees uh, the very end. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm thinking in terms of what he knows about Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, in this particular vision? Yeah, I mean, this is a very practical yep. for him. Now, can he see what's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar? Eventually? Yes, well, he's seeing the seven years and the restoration of him mm -hmm. after that. So, yeah, he's, he's seeing, for this case, at least the seven years. Verse 27, he, he gives him good counsel. And every good counselor should say what this person says. Unfortunately, most counselors in America today refuse to say this. Counselors today will affirm you in your sin mm -hmm. and tell you that you're good as you are and God perfectly accepts you just as you are. You don't need to change. Listen to Daniel, hmm. verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. He counsels perhaps. Perhaps it could, it could take long. Like the longer... You go walking with God, this will not, it, something is going to trigger this event, and you can stay that. Of course, God knows in his plan, he's not going to change God's plan from God's perspective, but here's my counsel to you, Nebuchadnezzar, do good and stop sinning. It'll go well for you. That, that's what I can tell you. Now, verses 28 to 33, Joyce, would you mind reading this? From the NIV, I have. We accept that. It's the need improvement version, but we do accept it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it has the cultural background. Yeah, I know. It's, I'm just messing around. It's a good translation. The, the 2011 TNIV became gender neutral, and that's why I, I mock it. You know, like they would take the his and t change it to they kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So instead of saying brothers, it would say brothers and sisters, but the Greek says Adelphoi. It doesn't say, but yeah, so yeah. So it says, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Mm -hmm. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. He's got these claws. He's got long hair. Before, it was while the word was still in his mouth, is not this Babylon that I have built, right? The boasting in his pride as the king. While the words are still in his mouth, he's reduced to the state of an animal. The nails start to grow. The and for seven years, he grazes about eating grass like an ox. And again, it's stated again in verse 32, until you know, you guys catching the thesis of the book of Daniel? Because it's the repetition again and again. That the Most High rules. Yes. There's the Sovereign. Yes. The Sovereign is God, the Most High. Over the kingdoms of, kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. The will of God. Ephesians 1.11 All things happen according to the counsel of His will. And that was the context of predestination. But it, it enlarges it. Not just who would be saved, but all things happen according to the counsel of his will. That's the issue, verse 32. His will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He's driven from among men and eats grass like an ox. He's wet with dew. 
eagle feathers for hair and <laughs> claws, bird claws for nails. This poor guy. Yeah, can you imagine? They were the first dreadlocks. Hair oh, the first dreadlocks. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he had been warned. He had been warned. But he, he's still continuing in that willful, hard, prideful heart. And it takes this. That's the whole point. God can so easily reduce him to the state of an animal. And then once he realizes the Most High reigns, restore him and restore his kingdom amazingly. Surprising that they would give him the reins back after he had acted like an animal for seven years. That's an object lesson of Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18. Yeah, go ahead. But aren't they, in at least what I have recently learned in some schools, that if a child wants to identify hmm. as a furry, <laughs> animal, furry. they can oh. literally yeah. behave yeah. as a furry animal. Like and candy. so, wow. And, and in here, in this, the cultural context of this, it gives plenty of that. And it says, it actually says here that it's, it's a, there are many scholars say it's a psychological disorder. Yeah, it is. And yeah. that identifying as a furry animal, here they are teaching in, that it's ex acceptable for a child to think but that we, it's okay. But we who know the scriptures yeah. and are aware that there is another world, how demonic is it when someone right. thinks that they're a fox? Or yes. An there, there are spiritual forces at play, yeah. and there is the judgment of God, that God is giving people over in the, the lust of their flesh to worship yeah. and serve created things. That there, That's a sign of judgment on a culture. Mm -hmm. When you have large numbers of its youth believing they're the opposite gender or some animal or something like that, yes. that is an indication that people are being given over. But here's the good news. God can still restore. Yes. And there are many that have, have come out from that. And, yes. and God can restore yep. them to a right mind. Let's hear the thesis of the book. I think verses 34 to 37, John and I said this at the beginning, that right from the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar, this is the point of the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Daniel's big idea stated in I, I, whenever I'm talking about the sovereignty of God, his free will over salvation, that nothing can stay his hand, all of these things are summarized. I love this verse, this chapter, this section, verses 34 to 37. So we don't have any idea how much time took place between 33 and 34, do we? Seven. Seven. Seven years. Seven. The, well, it's the end of the days, which implies the seven-year period. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Sue, if you would... And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wow. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of your kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles restored to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and mm -hmm. honor the King of Heaven, mm -hmm. all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able mm -hmm. to put down. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I think we're going to see him. Oh, yeah, yeah. there's a good sign that. there. Yeah. As long as he didn't revert again, again. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a pretty clear statement. And the point, though, of the book is that God puts that in the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar. God is able to put it in his heart, too. Yep. And that if he put it in his heart, God knows, sure. then he's in heaven, right? Yeah. Praise God. He's able to do it. He's able to save. But look at those words just one last time. Verse 34, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Back in that generation, it was Nebuchadnezzar. In ours, it's the Klaus Schwabs and the Putins and the Zelenskys. Sure. Be at ease, because our God reigns. Our God is still on the throne. He will raise up people, and he will put them down in his time. We have nothing to fear. We're to do what we can. We're salt and we're light. 
That's a preservative. Salt is a preservative. Light is casting out darkness and bringing truth in this dark culture. So we say what we say, but ultimately, we trust God. Amen. How many of you have been fretting about the state of the world and of our country? Not Don't yeah. fret. I know. Yes, I do. If, if you look at the external evidence, how could you not? Like, right. it's a clear trajectory, you know? Yep. From Obergefell now to trans, like, what's next? Is it children? Is it animals? Is it reverting to the state of an animal? Um, these kind of things. But God, he, can, he is allowing whatever he does for his purposes and for a time. Ultimately, he's coming back. He will reign forever. And that's the point of, of Daniel 4. As bad as it looked there, look how quickly he changed it. Make Nebuchadnezzar an animal for seven years and then cause him to issue a decree that Yahweh is the most high. What I keep it can happen like this for God. It's easy for God. Yeah, what's that? What I keep trying to tell Larry. Yeah. I'll let you guys know how the story goes. Amen. <laughs> so so the, re the reason I raise my hand that I do pray. Yeah. God is sovereign, and I know that. Mm -hmm. I know, I've read the end of the book. I know yep. how it ends. There is, there's no reason. It's my grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. grandchildren. And it's my grandchildren's, yeah. the influence that the world has. It's, our, it's the children that are going to university, even seminary. Yeah, and they and uh, and the influence on them uh, is God is sovereign. He is sovereign, but yet you pray with concern. Can you pray for them now and close us in prayer for this chapter as well? Thank Our you. Lord God, you are sovereign. Yes. What more can be said? You are sovereign, but our Lord God, in your design, you allow you allow Satan to have a reign within your bounds. We know that from the book of Job. So Lord, we do pray that the truth of your word will reach into our hearts, our children's hearts, our grandchildren's hearts, as it took Nebuchadnezzar to have this amazing punishment laid down on him. But at the end of it, he does confess. Yes. Instead of saying that there are, you are one of the most high gods, you are the most high God. Yes. You are the sovereign yes. God. We pray that although Satan is here, but God Amen. is the hope that we hold Amen. to. You are sovereign. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.